This is Musical Talk. Musical Talk. The UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Musical, musical Talk. Talk. The UK independent musical theatre podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Musical Talk. My name is Nick Hudson, I trust you well. Today we have a very, very special episode where you'll be hearing an interview with the Broadway legend that is Betty Buckley. We went to see her in the Jerry Herman musical Dear World at the Charing Cross Theatre, which is a, it's a, it's a charming, lovely little production. We're also sharing our thoughts on that. The production was directed by Gillian Lynn, most famous for choreographing Cats, Phantom of the Opera and, you know, a couple of other small shows like that. And also starring Paul Nicholas, most famous for being the original singing Jesus, as our friend Andrew Keating likes to refer to him as such. I'm going to hand you over to a discussion I had with uh, my friend Robert Gordon as we went to see Dear World. And I asked him to tell us first a little bit about the history of Dear World. Musical talk. Dear World is based on Girardot's play, uh, which I think was written just after the war, called The Mad Woman of Chaillot. And it was a play that was sort of slightly... Um, Awkward? No, it was pre-absurdist, really. It, it was a sort of just before the absurdist playwrights, uh, UNESCO and, and others, uh, and Adamoff in, in France uh, in the late 40s, early 50s. So... Uh, Girardot was a very important writer and he was very concerned with interwar politics, the, the politics um, uh, between Germany and France and wrote a play called called uh, Tiger at the Gates, it's translated in English The, the Trojan War Will Not Take Place uh, which uh, was written just before the Second World War in fact did take place. Um, so I think a lot of the play, the, the background to this play is very much uh, in wartime Paris and I thought it was very good, I'm not sure if it's in the original production, but I thought it was very good that the uh, It's set up from the beginning isn't it, yes, that there's a war going on. Exactly, that the dumb character uh, It's uh, dumb who can't speak Who not. can't speak, yes uh, uh, and the mute character uh, uh, is is rendered mute by being kicked about by uh, Nazi uh, uh, in their throat, you could say. SS men, yes, yes. Uh, and so um, I thought that was that was quite useful because it did give you the feeling that this was a country at war. And then Jerry Herman went and wrote a musical about it, which is, an, forgive me if I'm wrong, but one associates Jerry Herman with, dare I say, frivolous musicals. Yes, well, I mean, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry Herman, I think, himself would say, you know, he, he loves show tunes, and uh, he's... Well, he wrote very, half of them. He's wrote, very famous for having written them, yes. And, uh, but I think after Hello, Dolly, and then in 1966, Mame, uh, he came up with the idea, I think it was his idea, for um, to make Dear World out of the Mad Woman of Shio, and he wanted to make a very small, intimate piece... Uh, matching the 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 tone of the play uh, but the producer i think saw the opportunity to make this into a much bigger piece and he was encouraged to model this on the success of mame and it hello wasn't dolly what's his name was it the american one that no one liked i don't know if it was david merrick or not merrick, actually yes. may may well have been merrick but but in fact so 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 there was a sort of tension between the producers intentions and uh, Jerry Herman's and I think Jerry Herman felt it failed because of that but of course once they had Angela Lansbury uh, who won a Tony for playing uh, the main woman Aurelia, the Countess the Countess Aurelia, once they had Angela Lansbury playing it, uh, it was bound to get bigger because she could potentially pull in an audience but it ran about 167 performances so although it wasn't a total flop uh, it didn't succeed at the box office it didn't make back its investment and we're delighted to be treated to Betty Buckley in this uh, production of Dear World, and Paul Nicholas as well, and uh, such other familiar faces as Stuart Matthew Price and Rebecca Locke. But more, uh, tell us about Betty Buckley, Robert. I thought Betty Buckley was very good casting, and I, I thought she was very good in it, because she's one of those singing actresses who really is a good actress and who has a big voice when she needs it, but who keeps it in check. She's not a sort of diva performer, um, and that's what I liked about her performance. I thought she was eccentric, but not uh, camp. Uh, I think that there were two lovely camp performances by the two other mad ladies uh, in the show, Annabel Leventon and Rebecca Locke. Uh, I thought they gave delightful performances. But and they, the invisible dog. 
<laughs> the Invisible Dog gave a good performance, but they were they were um, they, they were supporting characters, and I think it would have probably been a bit insufferable to to, to have a rather camp performance at the centre. And I thought Betty Buckley stayed clear of that. She shows that although um, I think. Uh, she's now in her 60s she still has very powerful uh, voice and she uses the voice very well for the drama of the songs and she had tears running down her eyes at one point when she was singing her memory song well we were close enough uh, I Don't Want to Know which is the famous song that's been extracted from the show a number of times and uh, everybody knows Lansbury singing it Liza Minnelli has sung it I've heard Lorna Luft sing it it's often sung as a sort of cabaret performance but I think that it's a song that does work well in the show, and she she started it very quietly and built it very slowly to the vocal climax, and I felt it was a very intelligent reading of both the part and that particular song. The problem with this show is that there are lots of song moments, but they're not really moments at all. They're just bits. I mean, d- d- there's an embarrassment of riches. I think there are, in my view, too many good songs which are in some way unrelated to what's going on in the book. I think the real problem with this still is the book. It's been rewritten by David Thompson, uh, who rewrote a number of Candor and Ebb's early shows. Uh, He rewrote the books for those. Essentially, the plot is the cafe's in trouble. Let's get get rid of the baddies. The end. Yes, I think... Because the world is bad, and we actually want the world to be good. I think the real problem with the show is it's one of those plays... that it's The play that it's based on is one of those plays that's today seems rather fey and whimsical and it's very difficult to get away with that kind of whimsy in theatre and when you actually musicalise it it becomes even more whimsical and I think at times Jerry Herman does have a tendency to to whimsy uh, in in theatre and uh, I think that's that was that's the biggest trap of the of the play. I didn't think that the direction fell into that trap too often. I th- I think it was very well directed by Gillian Lynn. Uh, I would perhaps have liked to have seen a more stylized production overall to make the piece more surreal. But I actually thought it was very carefully directed, and uh, uh, sh- Gillian Lynn did the best job she could, I think, of the book as it stands. Um, Every now and again, the songs fit beautifully into the moment. Mm. End of Act One, for example. Yes, but, but one, yeah, one person, one a person. typical Jerry Herman marching song before before the parade passes by at the end of Act One of Hello Dolly. Uh, so here we have one person can change the world, which is a great song and very American and very. Um, well, I sent you they're all like Sherman Brothers songs. They're I all think very he's a better writer than. But than, than, they're than, all than, very positive American can-do atti- attitude, which is probably why. His songs are so loved by, let's say, musical theatre fans, if you know what I mean. Yes, I think they're they're real Broadway songs in the traditional sense. The show took a very long time to get going plot-wise, didn't it? Yes, I think that's Girardou's fault. I think that's in the play. Him! Well, I think, yes, I think the problem was was Girardou. Uh, Herman. Well, yes, but I think that, that the authors still, even with a rewrite, haven't managed... They haven't managed, in a sense, to motivate the plot powerfully enough. I think there is enough potentially in the plot for us to get interested, but I think the most complicated uh, plot moments are all narrated and they're happening off stage, so we're not quite sure what to expect. You said earlier that in the second half you didn't really quite know what was going on, and it was because so much of it was sort of talked about um, and not really in any way shown on stage or built in to the tension of the plot. But of course, the positives in this show are, are plenty, and uh, whatever you think of Jerry Herman's song choices, they're all wonderful songs. He's an absolutely brilliant songwriter. And I have to give special mention to Sarah Travers and her new orchestrations. And we've had Sarah Travers on the podcast before. She got a wonderful sound out of only sort of seven or eight players in the orchestra. Yes, that's actually an improvement on the original Broadway orchestrations, which are far too big for the show. The the orchestrations on the Broadway album, the original cast album, sound like Mame, and it's far it's 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 excessive in relation to the show. I thought she captured the tone of the piece very well in the orchestration. It, it, it almost had a French cafe feel to it, didn't it? Yes, it does try for that in in, in the original, but it's also pumped up, I think, with huge numbers of, of, of strings uh, and brass in the original in order to make it all sound very much like a Jerry Herman show. 
and wonderful writing by our friend Mike Robertson, who um, has about an eight-page bio in, in the programme, which is quite funny. He's done lots of stuff. I thought the lighting was good. I thought the set was good. I thought the costumes were good. Uh, it's great to see a show in a small theatre so with such good production values. I thought the whole cast... I don't think there's one weak link no. in the cast. And a, what a lovely voice Stuart Matthew Price has. Again, we say on this podcast... Yes, he's, he's, he has a beautiful voice. I noticed him first in Sweet Smell of Success at the Arcola, and I, I'm sorry he didn't have more to sing in, in, in this show. And now is the moment you've all been waiting for, where I'm going to hand you over to the interview that Robert and I did with the beautiful Betty Buckley at the beautiful One Aldwych Hotel, funnily enough, in London's Aldwych. Um, it's a great privilege to meet you. Oh, and, it's great and, to meet you, Robert. Uh, Thank lovely, you. lovely to have seen the show. We saw the show last uh, Tuesday and really yeah. uh, enjoyed it very much. I'm and so glad. Love to talk more about the show in, in particular, but first of all, perhaps something about about yourself. And uh, I mean, you've, you, you've you've played in London often, and I'm interested, mm-hmm. having looked at your biography, to see that in fact your first show was Promises, Promises in London. Right. I had done just uh, I did 1776 for seven months in New York City. I, Moved there from when I was 21 from Fort Worth, Texas, and got my first Broadway show my first day in the city, which was a major miracle. And uh, so I did that for seven months. I originated the role of Martha Jefferson, and then I um, got the role of uh, Fran Kublik in the London production of Promises, Promises, which was, of course, written by Hal David and Burt Bacharach and Neil Simon and produced by the legendary David Merrick. And um, that was very exciting. I was 22 years old, and it was my first time that far from home, uh, certainly, and starring in a um, you know beautiful musical in the West End at the Prince of Wales Theatre. It was a great, great year. I was nominated for an Evening Standard Award and at the Evening Standard set at lunch next to Laurence Olivier, <laughs> oh, which wonderful. was quite delightful. <laughs> and uh, another ca- occasion, Dudley Moore and oh, uh, Robert Mitchum and took me to lunch and it was just all very very exciting exciting time but then I did um, Sunset Boulevard in my mid 40s at the Adelphi Theater for Andrew Lloyd Webber which was again a divine year then I came back and did a month at the Don Mar with a show of my own called Stars in the Moon and um, that was released as a video and a CD and Got us a Grammy nomination. I have to say, now we're I, back. I have to say, I've got the. I saw the Stars in the Moon, which I absolutely loved. It was the first time I'd seen you on stage, and I bought the DVD and I oh, bought the excellent. CD. Oh, excellent! So I think Thank I you. count as a fan now. You, you have you're uh, in the know. It was a, it was a wonderful it was a wonderful uh, p- performance, wonderful Thank concert. You. Thank and you. and I think that's what, what what I so much have loved about you as a performer is that you know I, I always think there are there are some people who who do musicals who are kind of musical theatre divas who have wonderful voices and they and they do it and they're very powerful uh, but they're more sort of your Ethel Merman type of, of performer rather than really actors who sing and I think you're, you're such a wonderful actress and you Thank have a long you. career as, a, a, as an actress in television and film but you're a wonderful singer as well and people know you as a singer but there's nothing of the diva about you I say that oh, in the, you're so kind. In the nicest you. way that you are, you. you are a singing actress and those of us who, who are really interested in musical theatre as a serious art form I think look to people like you to, to, to set the example and I thought well, that thank was Thank you Robert, thank that, you that was so a, much That was what was so wonderful about um, Dear World that's, uh, what, that, that's what I loved about Dear World was it was almost it was like a cabaret performance from you because really it, it's Uh-oh. such a, it, Jillian no, no, no. Lynn won't like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I mean by that, it's such an intimate venue. It's intimate, yes. yes. And yes. to see the tears falling down your eyes, you wouldn't get that in the London Palladium or any other. You know, mm-hmm. I, I was banging the centre, staring at your eyes, uh-huh. and it, it just felt like such a wonderful intimate performance that is very thank you, you know. thank you very much uh, that's due to the space of course but um the Charing cross theater which uh, you know it's it's the perfect size for the debut of our of julie lynn's vision of this show which is very poetic and has a yes. delicacy about it and it's a real i i feel it's like a moving um art piece you know mm. it's um it's living art if you will it, unlike any other musical that i've been a part of it's there's such poetry to her interpretation and her vision of it yes. i'm really glad you enjoyed it what was that a part you you've often wanted to play or especially wanted to play or did it just come your way by chance well strangely um through the years of my career my long career at this point thank thank uh, god um, people have mentioned the show to me and said, you know, you should really play the Mad Woman of Shayo and Dear World and the Countess Aurelia. And um, uh, years ago, some folks that were considering doing it sent me the original script and um, the cast album. And 
um, I liked it very much. And of course, anything that Jerry Herman does is, you know, so memorable and so the music is so beautiful and moving. Um, but for years, since 1982, when I worked with Jillian, she was uh, such an inspiration to me, a real role model to me when I met her when I was in the New York original company of Cats and playing Grizabella. And I, um, I had admired her so much from as a teenager who was a huge fan of the musical theater. I knew of her work from Roar of the Grease Paint and um, um, How to Succeed in Business. And so to me, she and, and she is a legendary icon of the musical theater. So it was a thrill to get to meet her and work with her, you know, along with Trevor Nunn and Andrew Lloyd Webber, of course. And for me, the, the doing Cats on Broadway was the kind of, doorway into my potential as an actress singer which I'd always felt and had always set my my goal to be as good an actress as I was a singer and I felt I wanted to be able to be a very authentic very realistic truth-telling storyteller in in the form of musical theater and so the opportunity to play Grisabella gave me that uh, chance to step into the to my potential, and I owe a lot of that time period and my success in that to Jillian. So we've stayed in contact all these years as friends for since 1982, and she's come to see other things I've done, and we've corresponded through the years, and we've always wanted to look for a new project to do together. And she, two years ago, uh, wrote me and said, we're going to do Dear World. And I said, okay, that sounds great, you know. And then a year ago, it got serious. Um, our mutual agent, Jean Diamond, British agent, um, said that I needed to fly from, I live in Texas on a little ranch with horses and animal, mini animals. And she asked me to fly to New York City to meet with Jillian. So I did last February. And we had this uh, three and a half hour meeting and I said, I'm in, you know, I'm, I'm your girl, let's go, you know. So um, it started, the negotiations started in earnest at that point when she had a producer attached and um, and so we're here. Well, and that, that's, that's great, we're very <laughs> grateful that you are here. Uh, and I, I mean, I think what, what I really liked so much about the, the production, but particularly your performance, was that I know, of course, everyone probably has heard the legendary Lansbury recording. Mm-hmm. And, you know, great an actress as Lansbury is, I felt mm-hmm. she was obviously far too young for the, for the role at that time in mm-hmm. her career. And so, of course, she's done in white face, and she plays her a little bit as a sort of French clown, mm-hmm. whereas I thought you played her as a real woman who was oh, slightly yeah. dotty. And I really liked that, because I felt it grounded the show mm-hmm. in, in something, in, in, in a reality. And so, of course, it made the political, I mean, it's a very green, uh, there's green politics in, mm-hmm. in it, isn't Very there? Green it's, it's politics. so much about now. Since the, 19, I mean, the playwright Giroudoux wrote it in 1946, right after World War II. So he was way ahead of his time. Absolutely. And I think all the stuff about the bankers, you know, mm-hmm. everyone's sitting there saying, yes, yes, you know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the, 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 the bankers are the villains. Uh, but So I think that came across really well because it was so grounded in reality. Thank uh, you. Is Thank that you. something you, and since you, you've got a vast, you know, uh, portfolio, uh, uh, as it were, in your, your career uh, as, as, a, as a serious actress in television, uh, and uh, and in film, is that something that you always like to work on in musical theatre? That that you've, you know, bec- because you are so practiced as a as a television and film actress and, and theatre actress, not necessarily just musical. Because of course we know you, you you know your 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 sort of fan base really. I think wants to see you as a musical theatre star, which mm. you are. Um, but uh, is that something you always approach a, a musical play? Yeah, with? I, it's it's just my taste. You know, the the work that I love in the world is about, you know, there's a, a heart of truth in it. And um, the actresses that I love, the singers that I love, all the work that I love, dance, theater, um, concert work, I, that's what I like. That's what I go to hear. You know, that's I go for people to touch me with truth. And um, so, yeah, I, I always start from that and do my best to bring that to the piece moment to moment to moment um, to the best of my ability. Um, so, yeah, I'm committed well, that, to that. I mean, I, I think that's a great uh, approach because it seems to me something like this, if you if you played the part too uh, too whimsically or, or in too much, too much of a stylized way, we wouldn't get the sort of earthy humour that there too is. Too much in a which kind of way? In, in a whimsical way. You know, but use another word too, uh, stylized? Uh, stylized. Stylized. Yes, yes, stylized. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you're picking up my South African accent. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 I, uh, um, I'm, I'm not quite from a ranch, but, <laughs> but uh-huh. almost. Uh, um 
Um, no, that, that it's a stat, you know, because it often is done. I think. I, I mean, the the, the the original play, you know, in quite a stylized mm-hmm. way. And I thought that what was good about this was we started to laugh, even at the other two uh, mad ladies. We started to laugh because, in a way, they were real, even though Annabel mm-hmm. Levinson and Rebecca are, are much aren't more, they amazing? Uh, <laughs> They're so they fabulous. Performances. But I thought because you were real, we we understood what was being said that the, you know uh-huh. that these people are not really mad they're more sane than anyone else yes oh eccentric. good I'm glad you felt that way because yeah, yeah. I think they are more sane than yeah. any, anyone else yeah, I think that came across well. I love the idea that these older women give themselves permission to be utterly creative and completely expressive and you know what defined madness you know the, the mad woman of Shio, the mad woman of the flea market or whatever that was that was perplexing to me and or my quest was are they really mad? You know, I don't think so. I think, you know, historically, um, in all cultures, they've always referred to the wise ones as the mad people because they thought so differently. And, you know, in, in like Buddha was considered, or any of those gurus from India are often were often referred to as quite mad and eccentric, certainly. But they were, you know, the embodiment of truth and uh, trying to, live the joy that we're all meant to have the opportunity to live in this life. Mm. And that's what I love about Countess Aurelia. She's a very joyful being, and she's committed to that optimism mm. no matter what in a world that's asking her to think differently. Yes, I think that's what's interesting, and that's what makes it so typically, on the one hand, a Jerry Herman musical, mm. but also unusual for Jerry Herman, that in, the, in that, you know, it's not Hello, Dolly, it's not Mame, it's not a farce with, mm-hmm. a, with a very strong central character, it's, it's, a, it's a play with a very strong central woman, mm-hmm. which he so often writes, but, but, but that it's got his sort of humour and his sense of, of that women, women are powerful, and mm-hmm. that women can be powerful, and I thought, well, you've talked about Gillian Lynn, mm-hmm. and you know, there, there you are, all powerful women yeah. uh, in she's the She's amazing, she's just, she's turning 87 this week. Isn't it amazing? Yes. Every day in rehearsal, I just sat and watched her with awe. You know, yeah. she's such a magical being. It was just thrilling do, to do, get do to work with her again. That's why she's drawn to the show as well, because there is that wonderful line at the end of the musical, isn't there? There's nothing a woman can't. It, nothing is ever so wrong in this world that a sensible woman <laughs> can't set it straight in the course of an afternoon. Oh, that's lovely. It's, yeah, it's I love that lines. line. It's my favorite line, <laughs> and it gets such a great, wonderful laugh every night. Can I? Can I? Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, we, we really enjoyed uh, your performance and 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 the production uh, uh, enormously. And just to just to switch a little bit to some sort of maybe an anecdote for 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 your fans, uh, everybody knows that you were uh, uh, perhaps infamously in the original New York production of Carrie, which oh, yes. is now becoming legendary in a different kind yes, of way. Yes, it's been that legendary for a while now since we closed. <laughs> I think. But you were but you were also in the original movie, which which I think a lot of people yeah. don't realize. Oh, really? And I wonder how you how you felt about uh, the, you know the differences I mean because you must have had a perspective some perspective on the film when, when you were in it as a very oh, yeah. young, young performer and then coming to that strange uh, well it was a great of... film and it was you know an opportunity for seven of us to make our, our major feature film debuts and so it was a, a really wonderful time and there was a tremendous camaraderie with this you know young cast and Brian De Palma of course is a brilliant brilliant director so it was a great joy to get to be in the film um, when the 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 writer, the screenwriter Larry Cohen, was the librettist for the musical Carrie, and my friends Dean Pitchford and Michael Gore wrote the score, and they're, they've been good friends for years. Um, they called me and said, "You know, we're going to do a musical of Carrie," and my first response was, "Why?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they were like, "No, no, you don't get it. It's going to be great," you know. And uh, I said, "Okay, if you guys think so," and they said, "And we want you to play Margaret." So. Um, it was a, an interesting journey. So we started negotiating and then uh, couldn't come to terms. And then they came to London with Barbara Cook. And that uh, production was sorely attacked. You know, I mean, it's like this huge, um, um, it, was, it was rough on everybody. And Barbara Cook didn't want to continue with it. So they called me again and asked me to come in for the New York production. We started negotiating again. And, um, and then I decided, yeah, I would go in and because they were my buddies, you know, so. Was um, it was it sort of courage or, or, or loyalty on your part? Or? It was all those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, or did you think that it, it, it could have, it might have worked? No, I think that the mother-daughter sequences were really, really powerful, and the, I loved the music. I thought it was very operatic, mm. and um, I was thrilled to be a part of that. That And Lindsay Haley was brilliant mm. in the show. She was 17, making her Broadway debut, and um, there was just a, um, a directorial perspective that didn't allow 
the piece to coalesque. Um, and Terry Hans, who's a brilliant director, didn't really, in essence, understand the Americana of that show. And so it had a lot of elements that just made no sense. Uh, and there was some cutting and rewriting that needed to happen that um, they were not afforded the opportunity to do. So um, I thought we did an incredible job with, with it. I was really, really proud of the work that Lindsay and I did. And the critics and the audiences received that with um, great enthusiasm. It was, it was quite an event. Um, people would talk to us from the audience during the show, and uh, it was just wild. And if the producer had had the money to push it past the mixed reviews, they didn't universally get bad reviews, it got mixed reviews. I think we could have run, and it would have been become one of those yeah, real yeah. Um, event musicals. And the score still has a cult following. Yeah, it, I mean, it totally does. There's a huge the following CD, to it. Yes. And then, of course, they redid it this year off Broadway, and um, got some nice responses. And so now it's being done in every high school you can imagine everywhere. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you've been associated with some huge successes, like like Cats, which have been both critical and commercial successes. But you've also been quite adventurous, I think, in your choices. In that, in that, as far as Broadway theatre is concerned, you've done uh, you've done shows that either like like Carrie that didn't didn't really succeed commercially mm. or like Sunset Boulevard which should have succeeded hugely because I think it's but Lord it Weathers. did succeed hugely but, but, but apparently they lost money I think because of the no they didn't no, oh, is that just a no they made a lot story? of money okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. oh, well, okay. that was a Good. huge success I won't cry for, for yeah, Andrew I mean and I can't believe the gossip about that show <laughs> because that, 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 it was like yeah. jam packed all the time well I, I was uh, yeah about to say I, I, I saw the original it was a very expensive show but yes, yes. it really but he closed they, it and then had to reopen it again you know that was here in London, London yeah, but yeah, that yeah, was yeah. with the cast that yeah, I yeah, yeah. was in, because he had gotten such mixed reviews uh, from the initial production. And then uh, the LA version was received differently, and then he brought me over yes, and, yes. and closed it down and reopened it. It was a huge hit. Well, I, I, I think, and uh, then I went and re- to New York and re- did another year there. I think that you you were probably the best. Uh, you gave the best interpretation of the role. Well, I really, thank I really you. did. Thanks. I loved it, and I saw. I've seen three three people in it. I won't thank say who you. the others were, but, yeah. I, but <laughs> I don't think but, we really compare. It's just no, every no. every lady is really different in that part, and which just was exciting. You know, yes, it was yes, like that kind yes. of the the circus of the supposed competitive divas, which yes, certainly yes. isn't true. No, um, you know, but that was the scuttlebutt and that was the press around it and it was a very exciting time period and a divine two years in my life you know oh, that's nice to hear. working yes. for Andrew Lloyd Webber yes. is just bliss really oh, I yeah. thought I mean because because it, it really is I think it's his best oh, work I, love and I, I that think it's show. a wonderful show and I, I, I think it's very unfairly treated I, oh. I don't think uh, neither London nor Broadway critics are, are, are kind about Lloyd Webber but I think if you see the range of what he's done oh. you may not like he's everything he's amazing but. and um I just somebody posted on my Facebook page recently um, a pirate copy of the New York production of, that I was in, in in Sunset and had that removed. Uh-huh. <laughs> had that removed. No, no, I was no. fascinated to watch it, and uh, I just saw like the first you know fifteen minutes or something, ten minutes I guess, and it was just fantastic. I was just like, oh my god, this show and the intricacy of it, the complexity of it, the beauty of it, the spectacle of it. It was really, and the music was yes, stunning, yes, yes. absolutely stunning. And then it also has the Costumes, moments of the moments beautiful. of intimacy, which are yeah. so, you know to, to have such a big show and then be able to focus stunning. down. Stunning. That's what's so lovely, you, you know, yeah. about a show like it was that. It's glorious, glorious. And also about about Dear World. I think it's the same. You know, that, that one feels the music sometimes really swells and makes us all. You know, one person can save the world. Yeah. Which I, I mean, it's such a one. It's a wonderful American thought. Yeah. But it's also you know the, it's the kind of thing that British people very quietly want to sing along with. Yeah, yeah. We, we sort of agree, but I think it's a wonderful anthem that that song it is a wonderful and anthem. then suddenly the show grows and becomes you know from this intimate chamber thing mm. into a large scale uh, uh, you know mm. a, a battle for, 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 for survival of the individual and yeah. survival of the race I think that's something very moving about that deeply yeah do you uh, I mean do, do you have any uh, I mean you know since you've you, you've mastered so many different media uh, as a performer do, do you have any any kind of favorite medium or I mean do you do you do you I mean I don't want to nudge you to say I'm really a great Broadway Broadway performer. That's what I love best. But d- d- any sort of preferences or any kind of work that you like to do best? Yeah, I love best uh, singing, whether it's a musical or a concert, with brilliant musicians in a beautiful acoustic hall. Mm-hmm. You know, the- a theater that has an acoustic resonance, because that's really what my voice is meant for. Is that sense of what I was fascinated by. Uh, when I was a child and I discovered that I could sing was 
resonance mm -hmm. and uh, echo spaces, of, you know, and so I would sing under culverts and under highways or in the shower or in churches, you know, and when I lived in New York City, I would go into all the great cathedrals and, you know, at closing time and sing to hear the, the resonance of the space, you know. When I was really young and moved to New York City, I went to Carnegie Hall and snuck in and sang in the space while they were cleaning up and then Philharmonic just to see what that felt like and how it sounded, you know. So that's what I love. And whether it's a musical, there's nothing, honestly, more exciting than um, an opening night in the musical theater, um, whether it's Broadway or the West End. There's nothing more glamorous or exciting mm -hmm. than that. It's just divine. It's so thrilling. But, you know, I love, I just am so blessed to work with brilliant musicians, and in this case, in Dear World, brilliant collaborators and great musicians and a great orchestrator, a divine director, and an incredible cast. That mm. cast is mm. just bliss. Mm. That's what's so lovely about you know go, going to a show like this, which in in its current uh, production is is a fairly small cast, but every single role is so well cast. And Beautifully you feel, uh, cast. It works yeah. so well because of that. Yeah, uh, she uh, took months and months to cast it. Julian did, yes. and there are people in it. There's not. Um, Everyone, besides being brilliantly talented, is so sweet-hearted. You know, there's yes, just a, yes. a, a very loving heart at the center of that production, which is Jillian's, and then the rest of us have, you know, followed from that. And, of course, Jerry Herman. But, um, it, yeah, it's a beautiful experience, and I, you know, feel so blessed to be able to still do this. Um, you know, it's, it's a great... Uh, has Jerry life. Herman seen it, or will he? No, will he, he has able? a lot of health issues, yeah. and so he... Yeah. You know, we were all hopeful that perhaps he could fly here and see it, but mm -hmm. it doesn't look like. But he it knows about he does he knows about it now. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He he and Jillian met many times, and he gave her his blessing to you know for carte blanche to do what she wanted to do with it. Was this the first time you'd worked with Paul Nicholas? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. And Jillian and wrote me about him and said that he was the original <laughs> Rome Dumb Dugger. And so, so my assistant Kathy Brigandi and I looked him up on YouTube and saw all of his old pop videos and that we would come in to rehearse. Isn't that singing wonderful that you probably know stuff. exactly what he did because yeah. you were in the it production of New York? And... <laughs> He's so funny. He's uh, 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 another thing that really interests me about uh, about your career is, is um, that I notice in your biography that you have been teaching. For almost your entire career, you've mm. you've actually taught singing and, and music, and it, it, you played. Of course, I remember you from Oz. I, lo mm. I loved Oz, and I, I remember you as the too. teacher in in, in Oz, weren't yeah, you? Uh -huh. And and so, I mean, is, is teaching something that? How did you come to that? Was it always well, something you wanted? Well, everything to do? I know how to do well, I learned from great teachers. Everything, and um, I've studied for years and years with some of the best teachers in the world, and I've just always felt like it's my obligation, my responsibility to pass the tools along. Because, you know, I, the tools are why my work is successful and they can be learned and they can be, you know, utilized very practically and assist everybody. So that's, I think, my responsibility is to help share those. And you also have the most incredible speaking voice, if you don't mind me mm. saying it. And I noticed you won an Emmy for an Thank audio you. book. Now, personally, I've... I never, I, I love audio books, but I've never met anyone who doesn't before. So a question I have is how... how What's the process of recording an audio book? Because you never hear the page turns. Oh, good. <laughs> do you memorize it? Or no, do no, you, no, no, no. Do you read it loads of times? You read it. And then it's edited? Or, I mean, yes. Uh, mm. Who has the power as to how it's directed? Is it the, you or the director? The director and the engineer, you know, but it's just you in a studio with a director and an engineer, and you Is stop talking on the page turns. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's no, it doesn't take that long, um, and it's really fun. I've done several of them. I, we actually got a Grammy nomination Sorry, for uh, the Diary of Adam and Eve, um, but yeah, it's 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 just a pleasure. I love doing audiobooks. I've done several. I did. I forget what was the the name of the book, but it was a, a pop novel that had a lot of sex scenes, <laughs> and I was like really, I was, I was really n nervous to do that one, and my producer was like, just go for it, and I was like, okay, you know. That's what you call a page turner, yeah, those yeah, pages yeah, could that, was, that was Not particularly, speaking, no. particularly fun, but I was also really proud of a book um, by Larry McMurtry called Buffalo um, Gals, that was uh, a Buffalo, Buffalo Gal, Buffalo Girls, Buffalo Gal, or something like that, 
um, anyway, that was a great book that got a lot of attention. And um, I did different accents and different voices for each character, and they had Indians and cowboys. And, and it was a. Uh, back to Dear World, I have to say, you do an incredible British. Thank you. Accent. Thank you. That My cast has kept on me. I, <laughs> the first day, I said, because I'd worked with a dialect coach, and I said, but you guys, you know, I'm from Texas, and so I have all these wrong sounds for British speech, you know. And Jillian had, you know, contacted me months in advance that we, we were doing British accents so I need you to be up on that when you get here I was like oh, okay so I had done my homework but there are still traps for me that as a Texan um, that really th- that my friend Rebecca uh, keeps saying in the show she keeps saying it's your your the R's your R's are and your L's are too far back in your mouth and she keeps <laughs> trying to show me how to do that and so I go in for like dialect checks I- into the girls dressing room before I go on and they they're always coaching me you'll, you'll have to invite them all back and do something in Texas yeah <laughs> well actually Rebecca was just up for a film and we hooked her up with a brilliant dialect coach to help her out with her American accent and so, but yeah, I have to, it's something I have to stay really up on because um, <laughs> the other night, <laughs> oh, something happened, and then uh, it was just we were all like askew in the Mad Woman Park scene in Park Colomb, and Park Colomb, excuse me, <laughs> and um, I said the word I have to say the word dancing, you know, beware he'll make you put on black riding boots while he dances the can can <laughs> around you while singing God knows what filth at the top of his voice. And so I have to be really careful with that one because it has dancing and then can can, yes. right? Yes. So the two yes. A sounds, which uh, we would say, in North Texas, we'd say dancing the can can. You know, so I have to be really, I have to be yes. so thoughtful about that every night. And the one changes, but the other doesn't. Yes. So, so in, in, and so know. I get to that point every night and I'm like, dancing the can <laughs> and so that night for some reason there was we were all everything was just screwy I was all weird so I said dancing dancing <laughs> the can can and my my castmates looked at me Annabelle and Rebecca were just like you are such a <laughs> nutcase <laughs> and, and, and Jillian was in the back of the house and she was like no she didn't she didn't just correct herself on stage <laughs> and then my friends from the show told me the next day that they had friends there that night that said, we thought she was British until <laughs> she said da- dancing, dancing. So I was like, oh, bummer. I have to say, a friend of mine was in that night as well, as well and he pointed out that you uh, said the word both, in both accents, which uh, was... That was the night. Oh, no, that was the night you were there. No, 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 no. Not the night we were there. It was, it was, oh, it was a oh. night, wasn't it? It was, it was a Wednesday night that happened. No, I think... It, I don't remember what night, but they it all was into just one. like, oh God, I was so embarrassed. I walked off stage. I was like, no, I did not do that. You, you, you are you are sort of many time award winner in, in various kinds of awards and and um, uh, a huge number of nominations. Well, mm-hmm. almost everything you've done actually on Broadway and in London. Lovely that you were first, you know, nominated. That's a nice story about the Evening Standard Award when <laughs> you were so sweet, young. Yeah. Because it doesn't sound like a Tony, but it, of course, in those days, especially, it was I a very was prestige. Really excited. Because it was the only one in London, I think. Yeah, it, was the, yeah. it was the equivalent of the Tonys here. Really. There was a great glamorous luncheon. And yes, yes. But uh, uh, you, you've recently been inducted into the Theatre Hall of Fame. I mean, just yes. a few weeks ago. Yeah. Was that fun? I mean, what did they do? do well, you... I was really excited. I found out last fall, and then I knew I'd be working during the induction ceremony, which was January 28th. and um, I was hopeful that I could fly over for the day and come back. And you're supposed to ask a friend to be your presenter. So I asked Ellen Burson to be my presenter. And then the producer was like, when, when will you know, when will you know? Well, you know, I got sick in the first week of rehearsal and was out for quite a few rehearsals right at the very beginning. I had this horrible, horrible cough. And, um, so I was playing catch-up after I got well through the whole rehearsal process. And so the, the ceremony on the, on the 28th was exactly, um, was less than a week from when we started previews. So I just couldn't go, I couldn't go. So I asked Ellen if she would still be my, she was already set to be my presenter, if she would receive the medallion for me as well. And she sent me photographs and friends that were there at the ceremony said she really 
you know, was wonderful and brought my spirit into the room, which was so kind of her. And she's a great friend. But we're going to have, she's going to come to London, I think, and see Dear World. And we're going to get together to have our own private oh. induction ceremony. You'll, you'll have to, you should have a presentation at the, at the end of one, one, one oh, of the shows. Oh, cool. you know, that'd, that'd be cool. That'd be really cool. I think, I think the British... British people like that sort of thing, don't oh, they? We, we pretend that we're not, you know, sentimental, but I think we're terribly yes, sentimental. Yes. A, a question I like to ask a lot of American guests on our show is, how do you find, because you've obviously performed both in London and on Broadway, is mm. there a cultural difference between the, the theatre goers? Oh, yeah, yeah, big, big cultural difference. Um, the humour, our sense of humour and the British sense of humour are a little different. I couldn't exactly describe to you what that is. I've been trying to put my finger on it for a number of years, and I can't really, um, I don't have a definition system to define what the differences are. But, for example, in Sunset Boulevard, the laughs came in very different places in London than they did on Broadway. Um, but the audiences are equally enthusiastic. Mm. You know, there's a, a real passion, of course, for theatre here, and as there is on Broadway. I'm glad, personally, you know, to find that British audiences are less reserved than they used to be in, mm. in, in expressing their enthusiasm. Because mm -hmm. I always think, you know, if it's a live performance, the actors enjoy the, the, the response, mm. but the audience enjoys responding. Oh, yeah. It gives us something to, to, yeah. to show our Our enthusiasm. show is, is so, it's peculiar, Dear World, you know. It's like, a, I was thinking before our interview today how I would describe it, and it's, it's like a wild ride. And you have to be willing as an audience, you know, member to go on the ride with yes, us yes. and to take it on its own ter terms or you won't have as much fun as you could have. Yes. And so when the audiences that we have received thus far, and we've only been running for two weeks, uh, you know, week of previews and then we opened last week. When um, the audience comes with that openness, we have all of us have so much fun and the show rises to... An, an even higher level I'm, but when the audience is reserved or resistant and sits there in judgment like show us we do our best but you know to, to maintain our joy and our camaraderie and our sense of fun within our own ranks but it's not as glorious as it can be yes. when the audience comes And but it's funny because you know Aristotle and the Greek theater when the Greeks formulated the rules for theater said the audience must willingly suspend their disbelief so it's really on the audience to come with an open mind and heart. And so it's the audience's fault if they don't enjoy the show. <laughs> well, well, sometimes no, it's it is a collaboration, yeah. indeed. You know, yes. and it's, it's like a final collaborator. Isn't if you it? It, precisely, if you don't come open and willing to to be with us in in the reality that we establish, then there's nothing. Again, we can I do. think that's something that's so nice about this show in this particular production because, you know, it starts very quietly, doesn't it? And mm -hmm. and it takes quite a time and it tells its story, you know, uh, it, you, you have to get to know the characters first. Mm -hmm. It's not like the kind of jukebox show nowadays that right. does it all for you mm -hmm. right at the beginning That's and you right. hardly have to do anything. And of course, for, for, for real theatre goers, you know, like myself, because I go to anything, you know, right, right, right. I would be seen at the opening of anything, but <laughs> even, the, <laughs> even the closing. But, but, but you know, uh, you, you, you're used to that because if it's a Shakespeare or, or mm -hmm. classical play, you're, you're used to that. But actually, even, my, even I, you know, still, when it started, I thought, well, there's no big number yet, you know, and she, and she hasn't belted Anything yet, you know, mm -hmm. and of course there are wonderful big belting numbers later on, mm -hmm. but they have to be dramatically justified. And right. of course you wait, and it's more exciting when they come when, mm -hmm. when you've had to wait for them. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was that was a wonderful craftsmanship in the writing and the and the production. Yeah, well, the staging and and the design of it are it's like this story unfolds. It's a fairy tale, a fable, and the story unfolds. You, you, you've done, you know, almost everything that an actress can do in, you know, in musical theatre and in film and television, you know, so, so many different things. I wonder if there's still something you'd like to do, some particular part you'd like to play or some kind of theatre that you feel you haven't had the opportunity to... We're, we're, we're calling all producers here <laughs> who are going to listen to this podcast and say... Oh, great. I've always wanted to work at the National, quite frankly. Really? Yeah, yes. I would look... I just think they do such beautiful artistic work there. Um, I think that would be really fun to do. Well, it's a natural um, place for you, and they'd be a fool not to take uh, up your, you know, I've always, your suggestion. Whenever I'm here, I go to their productions, I'm like, oh, God, yes. this is what theater's supposed to be, you know? Um, I, um, I would love to collaborate with the choreographer, Matthew Bourne. Yes. I think he's just such a genius. Um, I'd love to work for Stephen Daldry. I think he's brilliant. I'd love to work with Trevor Nunn again. I'd love to work with Andrew O'Dwyer again. I'd so love to work for Kevin McIntosh again. <laughs> a long yeah. wish list. Yeah, it's I think certainly an Anglophile, it seems. Yeah, I love, I love London. I, 
I must have lived here in a former life, <laughs> you know, because I, I just, it's so familiar to me whenever I, ever I come. I think you also have a huge fan base in London. I mean, I think you're, you're I hope particularly so. of, of all the, you know, American, the Broadway performers. I think you're one of the, the, the if not the best loved, you know, of oh, those. Oh, God, thank those, you. I do I, think so, yeah. I hope you're right. I hope they come see Dear World for sure. And, you know, I think I have another couple of Broadway shows in me, too. That's still on my wish list. Um, will you will you do some more concerts or cabaret in London? Would that be something? I that... hope so. We, You know, nothing's scheduled for now, but, you know, I've got a couple of great shows that I would love to share with people here. Well, I know we'd love to, to see them. <laughs> thank you. Well, Betty, thank you very much thank for talking you, to us Thank you, Nick afternoon. Robert. It's a pleasure. Betty Buckley there. For more information about Dear World, you can check out charingcrosstheatre.co.uk or about Betty Buckley, check out bettybuckley.com. This has been a production of Musical Talk, copyright 2013. For more information, please follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash musicaltalk or Facebook at facebook.com slash musicaltalk or visit musicaltalk.co.uk to listen to all our previous episodes. Thanks for listening. Have a lovely week. Bye-bye. Thank you.